I just was recently rereading C.S. Lewis, uh, The Great Divorce. And in C.S. Lewis's writing, he says, there are only, in the end, two types of people. The ones that will have said, thy will be done, and the ones to whom God will say, thy will be done, your choice that you made, versus yielding to God and hearing his voice through his word speak to you. Now, I say that because God's book is a record for us of people who did not listen many times. That doesn't mean that we can somehow in our foolishness think we can do better than they did because even though we have the lessons in front of us, don't, please don't raise your hand, for goodness sakes. But even though we know the lessons, we are constantly guilty of treading over God's word, sometimes blatantly, ignorantly, foolishly ignoring what saith the scriptures. Now I had a dilemma here because, as I said, we are not in, we are not in Nehemiah today. But in fact, something that is a precursor, if you will, uh, as you know, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are back to back in your Bible. So turn to Ezra, the first chapter, and if you have a Bible like mine, or something like this set up, Ezra will be the first page, and the page that's facing it, if you get lucky, will be Second Chronicles 36. And that's the setup for the message today. As we know that in Nehemiah's case, he responded to the news and returned to build the walls in Jerusalem. Ezra laid the foundation uh, the altar and the temple building. So there's a lot of history between the two books, but none of that would have happened the way it did and is recorded for us if we weren't reading. I'm going to read just the first portion of Ezra 1, and then I'm going to go back and read 2 Chronicles 36. Yes, I'm doing this like a woman, reading from the back to the front. Settle down. Ezra 1, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith king Cyrus, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And of course, here's the call for the people to return legally, to go back and build. Now, what I want you to know while I'm delivering this message is that that doesn't sound like a very inspiring beginning to a message. You'd expect there to be some good punchline first, right? But for those who are not so familiar with Cyrus, the king of Persia, a heathen king. God's control of history, so precise, so detailed, that you will find woven in this book how God laid out, even spelling out where Cyrus would come from, we're going to get to that, uh, where he would come from and how he would do all, how he would accomplish essentially Cyrus's edict is the beginning uh, of the people returning and marking the end of the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Now, Second Chronicles, which is just the book right behind there, so you've got Ezra and the one that comes right before it, Second Chronicles 36, the last few verses are essentially the same thing that opens first Ezra or Ezra 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, put it in writing, saying, and this is that, who, who is there among you of all his people? And anyone who wants to go, let him return. And we know that those that returned were very few. But 
here's what I want you to ponder while I'm preparing this. Many times we think God can't be in control, even though we, we know, we, those of you who come to church, you listen to me preach, you listen to messages, God's in control, but at times it sure as hell doesn't look like it, right? I have to just be honest here. You know, I have lived in the Word of God like this knowing if it wasn't for all of the things that are revealed here in this Word, I might just spin out of orbit because there are times when it looks impossible. God can't fix something or maybe God is not even watching. He doesn't even know what's going on. But here's what I want you to know. Uh, at least 120 or 150 years before this is this book that we're just I'm quoting from, Second Chronicles and Ezra, that opening ending and opening passage. Some 120 to maybe 150 to some estimates say possibly 200, which I think is too much, years before this was written, the prophet Isaiah foretold of Cyrus, foretold of the events. And just so you don't think I'm crazy, it's one of the reasons why when everything looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket, I hold on to God's word because I know if he's faithful in these incredible details, in fulfilling history and the way he said things would happen, then I know he is going to fulfill his word in my life as long as I keep trusting him. And I pray that uh, when we get into this message today, you realize there's a double... Uh, fulfillment here. There's one seeing God so faithful in his word, fulfill for history, and then there is one for you today in wherever you are in whatever circumstance you're in. So the background is to say I started with the present of what was happening. Cyrus issued the edict for the people to come back. People could do whatever they wanted and very few people of the people that were carried away, very few people came back. But a hundred or 150 plus years before that, God, through the prophet Isaiah, spoke about this one Cyrus who was not yet born. So I want you to turn with me first, the strange place, Isaiah 41, because I want to show you God's control on history and his faithfulness in even the smallest details. Now, for those of you people who are trying to keep track of everything I just said, it really doesn't matter. The background is God's in control. No matter what I say today, God's in control. That simplifies it, doesn't it? Yes, Good. Now, put this in your, in your brain. If you're trying to figure out a timeline, because I just gave you a big bunch of information, I'll simplify it this way. When Isaiah is prophesying, he's prophesying through several kings. We know that Isaiah's prophetic ministry begins somewhere in the realm of King Uzziah and ends in the reign of Hezekiah. We're going to say safely Isaiah's ministry lasted at least 64 years. And in his ministry, he foretold of many things that were going to happen that occurred in his time, that occurred 120, 150 years later, that are yet to happen. So that's the the prophecy part of this book, it's complicated at times. Isaiah 41. So, just out of nowhere, keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, made him rule over kings. That reference right there, the righteous man from the east, is referencing Cyrus. And you might say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean east? Well, Cyrus was born in Persia, that is east of Babylon. Now for the people who know their scriptures, just a few verses later, verse 25 of the same chapter, it says, I have raised up one from the north. Now, some people who don't understand this will think it's two different people, but it's the same person. I have raised up one from the north. He shall come from the rising of the sun. Shall he call upon my name? And he shall come upon princes as upon mortar and as the potter treadeth clay. 
So from the north, at a young age, Cyrus was removed from Media, Persia, north of Babylon. He settled there. It was from Media that he came down to attack Babylon. So these two references are both to Cyrus, about Cyrus, pertaining to Cyrus. So the first thing I want to tell you is those little details. If you're not careful, people say two different people. No, same person describing Cyrus's background. If you want to know about Cyrus's background and you want to get some good details, you go to, outside of the Bible, you go to Herodotus, the histories. And in here, some people said, well, how good are these histories? Well, bear with me. These histories pertaining to this man, Cyrus, are only a, basically about a hundred years after Cyrus. So this history, Herodotus' history, is written within a hundred years of Cyrus's lifetime. Now people say, well, how can you trust that? Well, it's pretty good information when it's within that short of a time span. Um, just like if we were writing history of a hundred years of America, that's close enough to be able to get some good details. If you were talking about the pilgrims, we, we have details, but they may not meet, be like uh, what everybody had for breakfast every day for 365 days of the year. With that being said, in this book, there is background to Cyrus that even greater details of his life that tell you that God had to be in control. Now, if you don't want to know about this, I probably don't blame you because you're probably not concerned about God's control in your life either. But if you're interested and you, you want to see, you want to end up shaking your head and saying, how can that be? Then you've got to read a little bit and hear what's going on. So we have Isaiah first talking about where this man will come from, referencing both east and north. That's Isaiah 41. From Herodotus, speaking of Cyrus, tells the history of the father of Cyrus marrying a woman and if you read Herodotus, you're going to find that this woman has had prophecies about her lady parts twice. I will not tell you. I know that will get your curiosity to go and read. <laughs> Whatever that means, Pastor, I don't know. Don't worry about it. But uh, she, Cyrus's father and this woman get married, and they have this, uh, this, this union. And there is a vision given. And the vision is that the child that she will bear in her womb will essentially usurp the father's throne. So when this child is born, there are orders given. This child, I'm referring to Cyrus as a baby. Orders are given for this child, Cyrus, to be murdered, to be killed by his own father. Now, the baby is delivered to a faithful servant and the servant cannot bring himself to murder the child as he agreed to do by the mouth of the king. So he delivers the child to somebody else. This somebody else happens to be a man whose wife is about to give birth to a child who is born, stillbirth, born, the child is born dead. So they swap kids. They take the child who is dead, put it out in the woods, and essentially tell everybody that's the royal child that should have been put to death, but they raised this child, Cyrus. It's later uncovered that this child, as he grows older, is indeed the heir to the throne, and the rest of it is history. So this child almost did not survive, but the foretelling of it in Isaiah, combined with the history, makes you say God was there all along. He was working this out. Now, to not bore you with the details of Herodotus, but I will, I will in a few minutes. Uh, you've got some background on, on Cyrus, his, his youth, his, his, his uh, almost did not make it, but is now alive. And yes, as was foretold, he ends up taking the throne and he sets up what will be the largest kingdom setting in place in motion the rise for when Alexander the Great comes into power and overtakes his kingdom, essentially all the territories that have been conquered by Cyrus and then some with Alexander the Great to, to really set up and fulfill history. And if you're one of those people 
who has followed prophecy, you know, in the book of Daniel, where the interpretation of the statue, do you remember that, the teaching in the book of Daniel? You see the various kingdoms. So you see Cyrus fits in there, the head in Daniel's interpretation of the statue, the head was the Babylonian kingdom, and as you move down the body, we've got Cyrus's kingdom, and after that we've got Alexander the Great, and then we've got the Roman Empire and so forth. If I was doing prophecy, we'd have to visit that. Today, I'm only interested in one thing, the verity of what's going on here. So I just told you in Isaiah, this tells us where he's going to come from. Uh, let's call it 120, 150 years before he's even born. That's pretty remarkable. Some may say, well, he, uh, Isaiah got lucky. Okay, <laughs> if, if you say so. But now, in Isaiah 44, if you'll turn there, we have the beginning of prophecies concerning Cyrus, specifically, and they are quite staggering. So, beginning at verse 27, most people start at verse 28, but beginning at verse 27, to give you an idea, we'll come back to this, about the uh, rivers that will dry up. That's right before, it says, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Jerusalem is still standing at this point. Are you even with me? <laughs> I mean, let's, let's do this this way. I met Dr. Scott, and he said to me, this is fictitious, by the way, the year I met him, he said, you know, you're going to be pastor of Faith Center but he's still alive. I would say, oh, come on now. Here's a prophecy regarding Jerusalem that the temple and the foundation will be laid, but it's still there. It's still, it, has not, it has not been sacked yet. So somebody reading this is going to say, what? how could that be? Into chapter 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden. What's the right hand in Scripture? Power. Thank you. To subdue nations before him, which he did. Now you tell me something. This man has not yet been born. He's going to subdue nations. God's given him the right hand of power. I will loose the loins of kings. Let's talk about this. Because those of you who don't know history, Bible history, Babylon was the most glorious, uh, impenetrable place, what now is a complete war zone, but then was the most glorious kingdom. And Cyrus will come along and conquer that kingdom and conquer that fortress which everyone said no one can penetrate, no one can penetrate, and liberate the people and issue an edict for them to return back to Jerusalem. But that is at least 150, maybe, I don't know, years away. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates and the gate shall not be shut. Now I read this and I scratch my head because I know archaeology, I know the history, and what has been recreated and rebuilt of a city which basically lies in, in ruins today. A great reconstruction of this city, the description of which, if you were to go, there's a museum in Germany that has a beautiful reconstruction supposedly of the gates of Babylon, and these what are being described as two-leaved gates. The gate shall not be shut. It was a fortified city. The gates always stayed shut. I will go before thee, a heathen king. The Lord says, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. 
I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron, referring to the gates of the city of Babylon, which, by the way, is still in the future. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou may knowest. Here, Babylon, the place where, let's call it the Fort Knox of civilization. And right here it says, I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, no accident, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. That's why when people say Cyrus was a believer, well, uh, he wasn't yet born, and when he was born, he may have acknowledged the people to return and to, to build the temple. That was what he was being used for. But he also did obeisance to many other gods and many other situations. Don't think he was uh, just worshiping the Lord. The scripture says, though thou hast not known me. Well, how could he not know him when he's not even born yet? But when he will be born, he will not recognize him as his God. Are you following me? Because it almost, I'm, I'm, some of you are looking at me like I have three heads or something. And I'm, I'm reading this thinking, anybody who reads this, will say, wow, knowing the history. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, I gave you strength, though thou hast not known me, that thou may know from the rising of the sun, from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is none else. For I form the light, create darkness, make peace, and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above. Let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. And here you've got this incredible picture of Cyrus being foretold. Now, if you go into the other passages in the scriptures, you're going to find some staggering things. How in... Uh, you stay where you are, because there'll be too much page turning, and some of you will get very frustrated. Actually, you know what? You need to turn there. You need to make some notes. I'm sorry. You need to make some notes here so that I don't have people getting confused with things. Isaiah 13. You remember that Cyrus is of the Medo-Persian Empire. He conquered Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So in Isaiah 13... It begins with the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, but that is not referring from verse 1 until verse 16. It is referring to future punishment. It is not referring to the events that we're concerned with. What we're concerned with begins in verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. That's why I said it's like mountain ranges. You've got to know there's spaces in between which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. And here is a, a picture of what will happen. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces. They shall have no pity on the fruit of their womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Stop there. Don't read any further because in between there are prophecies that go back and forth. God is woven in here some very interesting things. In Isaiah 14, we have the same thing happening. There is some back and forth regarding the king of Babylon. But all the while, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, I will use through the prophet Jeremiah, through the, the voice of Ezekiel, I will use the Babylonians to accomplish my purpose to the 70 years. And when the 70 years are accomplished, I will take vengeance on the ones who carried away my people, punishing them, king of Babylon. And Cyrus will be the vessel to do it. Now, all of this sounds great on paper and sounds even better when you realize what 
Cyrus had to overcome to get into the place called Babylon. And this is why you need to read at least some part, I need to read this to you, some part of the histories of Herodotus to tell you what is described about this city, Babylon. How, if, if what I've just read in the few passages, I could take you to many more, but if what I've just read gives you an idea that God not only said where this child Cyrus would come from, that he would be his vessel, his shepherd to accomplish God, to accomplish his good pleasure, to work his will, a heathen king. And if Herodotus is right, they had to penetrate the city that was labeled as impenetrable. Cyrus and his army are closing in on Babylon, and they realize that they will not be able to approach the city. You almost have to pinch yourself to realize walls that are possibly 300 feet tall and wide enough that, that guard the city, wide enough for four, two to four chariots to pass on the city walls and a moat by the, by the good fortune of the Euphrates River providing water so that no person could pass. And the people on the inside were so prepared in case there was some attack that they had food enough, talk about emergency preparedness, they had food enough to last, it's reported some accounts say anywhere from uh, a year's supply to five years supply of food. Cyrus is approaching the city and essentially what they did, I'll, give, I'll paraphrase, what they did was they dug where, to where the water, the Euphrates, the border of it, and they basically made a canal to divert the water so that they would drain it. Now, you'll read in Isaiah some passages that say, and Babylon's marshlands. I'm using a more common term than how the King James describes it. Why? Because they diverted the water. The water could go down. Herodotus says the men crossed, that the water was no higher than mid-thigh. Horses and everything went across. They penetrated, and in one night, if you want to combine the, the story or history of Isaiah with Daniel, you realize that Daniel's in captivity. He is telling the king about what's going on in the night that there's a grand party going on and everybody's got a lot of wine and they're, they're happy. Cyrus, the histories don't necessarily line up depending on who you're reading, but it's in this realm that Cyrus will penetrate and overthrow and the kingdom is absorbed and here's God carrying out his purpose through Cyrus, a heathen king. Now I ask you this again. If God can do all of this precise uh, maneuvering of a man who did not even recognize him as the Lord, the God, the God, but is in total control to make sure that when the 70 years are accomplished, he is the one to let the people go back. He's the one to say, return and build. Now you tell me, if, if you really believe God's word, and I do believe God's word, if God, is, if God has that much control on the details, how much more does he have control of your life? Now you, you will probably do exactly or say exactly what I've said many times, which is, that's those people, that's not me. God did that here, but he certainly can't be in control of my mess, right? <laughs> now, there's, there is a passage in Isaiah 45, a verse, that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it dawned on me that really this is a true statement regarding even these people. Verse 15 of Isaiah 45, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself. Don't you feel that way sometimes? Well, I want you to imagine the people who were in Babylon for 70 years, those who remember the former glory, not those who were born in Babylon, but those who remember. They probably would have been saying, where are you, God? You're a God that hides yourself. Now, I'm sharing this with you because clearly, clearly, 
there's enough information, and I'll probably do the rest of it on festival. There's enough information here. I've given you the, the history part of this, and probably very fragmented, so you'll have to go back and do your own crossing of the lines here. Enough to say that if God can do this, then God can be in control of your life. This whole passage resonates with the sovereignty of God. And read on, because Isaiah 45 and verse 9 and 10, we'll even include 11, give you the gist of my message. All of the historical background, we can, we can masticate, we can enjoy, we can say, wow, the Lord of history. And right nestled into this word of prophecy about Cyrus and the precision of what he will do and what he does indeed do, but years before he's even born. Isaiah 45 and verse 9, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Now I'm sure people who were able to read this word, when they were able to read it at a later time, probably said, there's no way that God could use something that is unclean, something that was, in their mind, unprepared, something that didn't belong to accomplish his purpose. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. And I'll let you know just a little hint right there that the word for maker is the same word that is translated potter. It's the same word used in Jeremiah 18. It's the same word everywhere that you'll encounter. Creator, when God, when God formed Adam, let us make Adam. The same word is being used as is being translated here, maker. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work hath no hands. Literally, your work has no handles. Nothing to grab onto. That's a much better translation, by the way. Woe unto him that saith to his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? So here's quibbling with the potter or the parent. And no matter how you slice it, God used this method, this way. And the reference here of the potter or the parent is significant. You see, every time I've approached a historical lesson, I've just said, let's just keep unfolding the history. But now that you've got the history point, let me talk about the application. And the application is, yes, in God's book, we find the concept of the potter, Dr. Scott's message annually, and sometimes twice a year, was on the potter's house. But the framework within the potter's house was for Jeremiah, for example, going down to the potter's house, and the, the lament was, can God not do with Israel what he was doing when he was working his work? Is God not able to reshape and reform? And just before the people are carried away into captivity, this prophecy is given. Is God not able to do with his people what he chooses? In the New Testament, when Paul uses the, the clay and the potter, quoting Isaiah. Remember, Paul is writing to the Gentiles, Book of Romans, in that particular passage regarding the Jews, actually regarding Israel, forgive me. And so you see, it's almost as though sometimes I think we can take the lesson and we can make it only apply to ourselves, but God is in control of history, his sovereignty over history, which I just described in Cyrus. And this verse that I read here of striving with God, striving with one's maker, is why I started this whole message by saying there are some people who will fit into one of the two categories that C.S. Lewis said, either thy will be done out of my mouth or out of your mouth, thy will, Lord, be done, or in the end, God saying to those, thy will, what you chose. That's the concept of the great divide. It's, it's heaven or hell. And some people think, well, they don't really have a choice in the matter. Well, you have, if, if God has opened your ears to hear, you have a choice to hear and to realize that this lesson, specifically in Isaiah, is kind of radical, considering that this man, Cyrus, had not yet been born, that God is foretelling of a future time of what a king who will ultimately rise up to conquer a nation and then be conquered himself, to liberate a people, to accomplish the 70 years. Now, if God can do that as the one who is the maker in control of everything, 
my question to you today, and maybe I have to put myself in the framework too for it to make sense, are we striving with God and talking back to God about even the smallest details in our life? God's control, if God has this much detail and this much control, I've got a few words here that really describe what I think is the lesson both for Cyrus in history, in prophecy, and for us today. Rejecting God's way. Now, we know God's way with man. We know God had to give his word, and God is not a man to lie. He gives his word and says, this is my way. In the New Testament, this is my way. Walk ye in it. We choose whether or not we are following God. Now, th this is not... I do not believe everything is wound up and you have no say in the matter. God gave us free will. He gave us the choice, the ability to choose to decide whether or not we, we desire God, whether or not we will follow his way, his word. But I, I digress for a minute to say, if you go back to look at Cyrus, if you and I were sitting back before history happened, before it actually unfolded, and we were sitting and discussing whether or not God could or would use a heathen king, but he did. It doesn't matter. God gave his word this way, and he said, this is, this is my word, this is my way, this is how I'm going to accomplish my purpose, using a heathen king. I often have to remind myself that this is the way God is accomplishing his purpose through me and through you. It does not have to appear, the package, the container does not have to appear religious. In fact, I don't want to appear religious. The container just has to be willing. That's me and that's you. Vessels that are supposedly wanting to know God's way and his word. I had somebody this week say to me, what should I do? Give me some help here. What should I do? I'm trying to follow after God and be committed to the best of my ability. And I just kind of went, hmm, best of my ability. That ain't going to fly. Abide in God's word. Listen to what God's word is saying to you today. Never get to the place where you think you've heard God's word enough that you don't need it. I was tempted when I read this passage to take you back to the key words that Dr. Scott taught. And I thought, no, you'll hear that on a replay. I'd rather tell you what's on my heart. You can make the application because you probably got notes in your Bible somewhere on the potter's house. In the back of your mind, you'll know what I'm saying is true. God is going to accomplish what he designed you to do, he's not going to fight you for it, but if you're yielded and surrendered and listening to God's word, God will accomplish his way with you. So then, that brings me to the question of rebellion. How many, please don't raise your hand, how many hear the word of God and decide still that they don't have to yield to it? And I want, I want this to be an intersection for the message where you say, I'm putting on the brakes right now. Because there are way too many people on the face of this planet. I'm not speaking about this sanctuary. I'm talking about on the face of this planet who think they are following after God, his way and his word. But if you ask them about the word, they know nothing about God's way and God's word. We know about God's way. The history reveals it. God's word, well, you've got to be in there. That's why I referenced John 15 so many times. But they'll make statements like, well, God's going to accomplish and God's going to do, but have not spent any time, and even that becomes rebellion. In other words, somebody who is a complete heathen out there has a complete and good excuse, which is, I, I don't know, I plead ignorance. I've told you many times. I, I, I save that, that's like a card in my back pocket when somebody talks to me about, uh, well, you know, what qualifies you? And I say, listen, I was out there in the world like the rest of you, doing all kinds of crazy things, and I didn't know the Lord. <laughs> right? Radio people, it's like I just pulled a card out of my back pocket. But it's a little bit different when you come to know and you come to realize God has laid out his word. Am I striving against God's purposes? Am I fighting God? Am I asking God why? And that, at some point, it's not bad to ask why, but when it becomes evil is when it becomes rebellion. I know what God's word says, but I will not, I refuse. 
And I really believe there are people, even in the sound of my voice, that after a time, God turns them over. He turns them away. Don't think somehow that God's saying, yes, I want everybody, the whole world will be saved. That is the error of some guy who used to preach in L.A. who said, even the devil will be saved. <laughs> well, listen, brother, if you want to go to that place where even the devil's going to be saved, it's going to be a little steamy. <laughs> don't believe that for a minute. Especially when you study the book of Revelation. I don't believe that for a minute. So, we have this rebellion. And that's part of man's estate, the blueprint of mankind. Our nature, our natural man is constantly saying, God can't. Imagine yourself now looking at these prophecies of Cyrus and make an application to yourself. Could God possibly use Melissa Scott, possibly, to accomplish his purpose for you to grow in God's grace or grow in God's word or come to a recognition, hey, God's, God's doing something here. I don't know what it is, but he's doing something. And that still remains the same even for you. When people say, well, what could I possibly do? Well, you'd be surprised. God's got a great plan. If you just shut up and quit complaining, he's got a good plan for you. Well, it, do it doesn't look like it right now. Well, that's why I said it's the, it's, this is the manifestation of striving. You're never going to get to the point, and I don't think I'll ever get to the point. I'm doing a little bit better nowadays, uh, uh, almost, we'll call it a safe 15 years later, 18 years later, 20 years later, saying, okay, God, I'm surrendering to this. I believe that I'm going to yield, and you're going to work it out. But do I still complain about what God's doing because I think he's not doing anything? Yes, absolutely. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that. And this is why a passage like this is so vitally important. The manifestation of striving with God is as natural to the natural man, to the natural woman, which is why we're told in the New Testament to walk, come under the control of the Spirit, the teaching out of Galatians. Lastly, if I were to kind of get this put together, I'd say to you, this passage speaks to me about God's sovereignty. And his sovereignty in accomplishing what he set out to do. Now, this is as old time as you can get because some of you sitting here are saying, well, you know, I've, I've sat through many lessons and I've heard many messages. Well, let me just tell you something. Never think that you've arrived to the point where you don't need to hear something over and over again. God's sovereignty in your life and creation, if you keep reading this chapter, you find out that Isaiah will slip into the thing that is God creating the earth. He says here, I've made the earth, verse 12, created and created man upon it. Even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all the, their host I've commanded. I've done all of this. Now, you don't think I'm going to leave you there to not be in control of your life? And I think this is, for me, this is the place I've come to, not just in the histories not just in looking back over the, the history of this ministry, but in my lifetime. And that is, God has been shaping me. God has been molding me and preparing me. And just as this passage in, in Isaiah is speaking about the maker, the potter, or the parent, you can do all you want, and you can say, well, I'm not going to stand for this, but see about how this application will gestalt down. First, in the pages for Cyrus, and then for you. I have here a few notes. God used Cyrus to what? Crush the Babylonian Empire, to liberate the captives. The people were then allowed to return, which allowed the temple to be rebuilt, the people to repopulate that reestablished worship in preparation for the coming of Christ. And you don't see God's hand in all of that? Now, the unfortunate part of this lesson we know is that if you keep reading history, you know eventually Cyrus's kingdom comes to an end, as I said, with the rise of Alexander the Great. And if you want to keep weaving history to watch God's control, if you see the span of Cyrus's conquering kingdom and you realize that that was essentially setting the stage for Alexander the Great to come and then the kingdoms after Alexander the Great's death split up, to bring you to the time of Christ, with all things being clearly revealed in this book, which is why I love Scripture so much, and you come to the realization that God all the way, even though people might have thought, well, 
How could this man conquering this much territory? How could this man conquering this much territory? How could this man suddenly to bring us to the point of the time of Christ? Which is why last week's message was very important to show you the genealogy, to show you God's control in the genealogies, God's control to bring us a seed, even though, as I said, we must get into the fact of where the other seed landed, but in the genealogy to show you God's in control, he didn't mess up, there wasn't a mess up there. There isn't a mess up here either. God said, I will do this thing. Jeremiah says he will accomplish it. So now we have probably, I want to say realistically, about a third of the congregation saying, yes, I realize God's sovereignty and God's in control. I'm still striving with God, but not as much. Listen to this, the second part of this. Not just the clay talking back to the potter, which we've all, by the way, done. God, what are you doing? Some have used other language. <laughs> but the last part of verse 9, or thy work... He hath no handles. I've said literally, the, a better translation is your work, has, your work has no handles on it. Nothing to grab onto. And we know, by the way, if you want to use the imagery of the potter and the, and the wheel and how things are going, it may seem like there's nothing to grab hold on, but you know that's a lie. You know that when things are out of control, this is the place you grab, you, you turn to God's word and you talk to God and you say, this is my handle. We call them faith handles, places to reach in where you know when everything else is spinning out of control. Hey, I didn't want any handles on me. I didn't want any hands on me either. I just wanted to do my own thing. And God said, well, we'll, we'll see about that. And here I am. <laughs> right? But I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you, the same thing is true for you. And there are people sitting in front of me who have a myriad number of issues going on, and the same thing is true for you. Now, you may be saying to God, what God are you doing with me? Or, take a look at this one. I like this, he hath no hands. Your work has no handles. Or, the, the picture of the parent. You're talking back, you know, kids today, a lot different than when I was growing up. I may be the last of the generation that you, you didn't sass. Hmm? Yeah, well, me, me, me thinks clapping is a little bit late right now, but. <laughs> oh, unto him that saith his father, what begettest thou, or the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me, tell me now what it is. And I'm saying to you today, God does have a plan. Let's talk about Faith Center. I've said this to you many times before. Let's talk about Faith Center. One of the few ministries left that does not have any other programs going on. Everybody succumbs to the pressure of what people out there want. And the only thing that I want is for people to come to know God's Word and come to trust their faith to increase. The minute we we start expanding into the world's idea of what the church is, we have now succumbed to the very thing that I think we ought to not succumb to, the temptation to please people in their ways in the flesh versus trying to get people to grow in the spirit. How do you grow in the spirit? Faith comes by hearing God's word, and you come to church, you listen to the network to grow and understand God's way, God's word, God's will, and God's work in your life. Now, as I said, I think we're the, one of the few churches remaining that hasn't had to uh, embark on some worldly thing to get people to come and to listen. Or there may be fewer people listening to me today in the sanctuary. But I can tell you in my travels in the last week, I encountered many more people who listen by different ways who find this is their lifeline, the only place of sanity where they're not being merchandised, they're not being asked to sign away their life or anything else that belongs to them because they realize it belongs to the Lord. See, fooled you. But we are doing something that is becoming a rarity, which is putting God's word out there and telling people many years now, this is the only thing that will bring faith, and faith is the only way to make it in. 
Now you can keep striving with God and you can keep fighting with me and you can keep fighting and saying I won't and I won't and I won't. At some point, I really believe this, at some point that spirit of rebellion, maybe God will just say, I'm done. I don't want to tell you about the 30 pieces of silver and about the, uh, the potter's field that was bought up because for some of you, you've already heard that. You've heard the fact, you know the fact that Christ bought up the whole field and yet children of a heavenly God, but I still want to act like a child of the world and I'll do what I want to do the way I want to do it. And that, my friends, is the definition of sin in the Bible. Now, I'm not here to say, hey, I'm going to burn down some barns with my sermon. I'm telling you something. If you can listen to what's being said right here in this passage and recognize that God took a heathen king to carry out his plan, how much more will he use you and use me to carry out his plan? How much more is he in control of the details? I'll speak now again for me, and let me, let me say this and I'll wrap it up. I think many times, as I have analyzed my situation, yes, in the early days, right after Dr. Scott's passing, I was striving with God. I was saying, not me, Lord. I, I'm, I mean, publicly appointed, publicly said, I am the pastor of the church. If anything happens to him, not me, Lord, I can't do this. This is not for me. I, I, don't, I don't have any of the things, the qualifications. I don't have any pedigree. I don't have anything. Not me. Lord, couldn't you pick somebody else? And if, I have not heard the audible voice, but I can tell you the result is God probably saying, nope. <laughs> I did. I, I, I was fighting God. It was just too much for me to absorb that God would. And that's why I said to you, when you stamp your life into the pages right here and you recognize God is doing the same thing now as he did back then. No, there are no uh, kingdoms to conquer except the kingdom of darkness. And for some people, that just doesn't even exist. But for those who know that it does, the Bible tells much, speaks much about obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And we talk about Rebellion. Rebellion is nestled in there as the sin of witchcraft. I see way too many people and hear way too many people saying, well, it's just too hard. You know, your, your teaching and, and the path that you present is just too difficult. I, I want to have some comfort. I want to have something that's a little bit more comfortable for me to be in. Well, then you don't want God as your maker and you don't want God as his hands on you as the potter and you don't want God's word, his way, his will, or his work in your life. You want what you want. God calls that sin and at some point God says, okay, psh, done. Now, my, my message is just a little bit different. I'm asking the people today, the ones who have not completely been seared over, the ones who have not completely said, nope, can't, to consider their ways and to consider God's ways today. Because if what I quoted here, which is God, you say, truly thou art a God who hidest thyself, then God may be in the smallest voice, like the prophet Elijah, that small, still voice. God may be in the clouds, like he was for the prophet. God may be in everything around you, but if you are not paying attention, you'll be like Jacob waking up one day and saying, truly, the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Now, the Lord is in this place. You don't come to church for the Lord to be in the building. We are the people who belong to the Lord. But you come to church to hear. You come to church to grow. You come to church to get connected to the rest of the body that when it really comes down to the hard choices, you say, I'd rather be the one who God is still pressing in uncomfortable situation of having to look at how God has placed me here or put me here or maybe he's taken everything away from you. Maybe he's given you things that you didn't think you should have or maybe things that you didn't want. And it doesn't matter. In the big picture, God is saying, I am God. I am the Lord of creation. I created man. I created Cyrus. I created you. Now, if you'll quit fighting with me, I'll accomplish my purpose. And it's a darn good one. But it takes that first mindset that says, this is uncomfortable, but I'm going to yield. Now, in the New Testament, the book of Romans in the sixth chapter talks about yielding your members. And many times I think people just think, this is, this is something just to consider. No, it's a way. To whom ye yield your members, that is to whom ye serve. Essentially, if you 
decide to yield yourself to yourself, you serve yourself. You yield yourself to God. You become the tools of righteousness of God. So I come back to C.S. Lewis to finish this off and say there really are only two types of people. The ones that, even though it's a tough thing to say, because you know what happens when you open your mouth and say, Lord, thy will be done. It means that God may take you like he took an Apostle Paul and lead you down a path. For the Apostle Paul, it was a pathway unto death. Boy, I'm going to have a lot of people want to come in the church today. <laughs> You know when you open your mouth and you say, Lord, thy will be done, maybe it will mean a lot of people who you were leaning on and depending on will flee from you. They will leave you alone. They will leave you feeling like you are friendless, hopeless, and impossible. Maybe uttering the words, Lord, thy will be done on earth, in me, means I may lose everything that I've been holding on to. Maybe it means I will gain things that I didn't think I should have or that I could have. But there are only two people in the end, those that say, Thy will, looking at these words out of Isaiah 45, Lord, mold me, shape me. If you can do it with Cyrus, a heathen king, you can do it with me. If you can do it with history, you can do it on me and in me and through me in my life, that when my history is done, I will have said, Lord, Thy will be done or the ones that God will turn to and say, you chose your way, and your will, thy will, not God's will, be done. There are many people in this book whose names are not chronicled. They are the people who decided they ought not to return to rebuild. Those are the ones that said, essentially, my way, my will, I will remain. Those that answered the call to this, from this heathen king to go back and prepare the way for the Lord, those were the ones saying, Lord, thy will be done. They did not know it at the time, but Lord, thy will be done. So I, I, I bring this all today to say two types of people. You do have a choice in something. You can keep striving and you can say my way or you can say, Lord, your way. Shape me and mold me. If you could do it with Cyrus, a heathen king, you can start with me today. That's my message. Come on up. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.